Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy, and you're listening to my podcast, Vox and Hops, brought to you by Sound Talent Media, where I sit down with my fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. Hope you guys had a wonderful weekend. I hope you guys had a wonderful holiday season. I am stoked to be back. This episode is brought to you by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal is one of Montreal's premier metal promoters. Not only do they put on a bunch of sick shows all year long when there isn't a global pandemic, but they also put on one of North America's best metal festivals. And trust me when I say this, it's the absolute truth because I have played just about every metal festival out there, and Heavy Montreal is up there with the best of them. I'm super, super stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops podcast. On today's episode, I am with James Monteef of Tesseract. Here it is. This is Vox and Hops, episode number 218. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everybody? Today I'm with James Monteith of Tesseract, and I'm super, super stoked to be with you because you are a very, very cool metal and craft beer person, and uh, it is, surprises me that I haven't had you on the podcast sooner because you're a very perfect guest. So let's start with a very, very simple yet complex question. How have you been coping with 2020? Uh, well, it's been, to be fair, I think that it's been bearable for me kind of more so than the many uh, i was really lucky that in terms of the band we were going to have a very quiet year this year anyway um so it hasn't really affected what we're doing all that much and um i've been lucky that i've been able to still do my job and that sort of thing so in a way i count myself really really lucky that i mean obviously this year sucks as it sucks for everybody <laughs> but i feel like I've, yeah it sucks less for me than other people that have had a really terrible time like talking to people I know that you know road crew people who are like just basically just scraping by doing whatever they can to survive I mean my heart goes out to basically everybody in the events industry and that's those sort of worlds who basically have been totally screwed by by this year so so yeah I count myself lucky so yeah I've been I've been relatively compared to the rest of the world doing okay thank you <laughs> Absolutely. how about you I'm, I'm I'm hustling along, just pushing along. Likewise with Cryptopsy, we were in a writing process year, so we had very, very minimal gigs cancelled. Uh, actually, only one, to be honest, so we were very, very lucky in that aspect of everything. And uh, it's given us some time to write, which uh, we needed. So, so that's going well. And the podcast, I've had a chance to chat with a bunch of people, such as yourself, where I love to sit down with my metal friends and talk about their life, metal and craft beer. So what yeah. beer do you have on your side there, James, that we're going to virtually share today? Oh, well, right now I'm drinking um, uh, Faith by Northern Monk, which is a, a UK brewery based up in Leeds, and it's a hazy pale ale. Which Beautiful. Is a, yeah, a British version of a New England style beer, I guess. Have they, have they tackled it yet? Have, do, do they got it down? Yeah, this is really good. It's really delicious. I'm a big fan of this one. Very, very cool. I have two beers here, and I'm going to let you choose which beer I'm going to drink. I have, uh, first up, the Vox and Overhops, which is the Vox and Hops Collaborative Brew with Overhop Canada. It is a double dry hop New England IPA with uh, Vic Secret, Enigma, and Citra Hops, 7% ABV. This is option A. And option B is the brand new Crisp Topsy, the Crypt Topsy collab with Kanawaki Brewing Company. This is Pilsner Supremacy, a New World Pilsner. It's a crispy boy that's been double dry hop with mosaic hops. So which one should Ooh. I drink today? Well, I think you have to go for the crisp topsy. I think. Beautiful. Uh, I think that sounds delicious. It's really, really very, very cool. And uh, from having spoken to Drew, their brewer, who I've had on the podcast before, uh, he might just keep doing it. So, so that makes me, I'm going to switch up hats because I'm switching the beers. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I'm always prepared. I love when breweries send me hats. So uh, I'm going to crack this crisp, crisp topsy. And I want you to tell me about your very first brew. Do you remember the first beer that you ever drank? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not going to be classy. It's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, I think the first beer that I have an actual memory of, um, probably when I was like sort of a teenager or late teenager, was probably drinking... Um, drinking bitter which is you know a traditional british beer 
which is served at cellar temperature, well, all ales, all traditional British ales are served at cellar temperature. Um, I, I say room temperature normally, but then it's only occurred to me that people in warmer countries, actually maybe not in Canada, but in <laughs> other warmer countries, they go, oh, gross. But, um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want a hot beer, but, but yeah, so it's, yeah, it's um, basically just a very mild flavour, very lightly hot, um, quite brown in um, appearance. And, um, and yeah, I didn't, I wasn't that into it. <laughs> Although to be fair, over the years, I really grew to love it. And I love, I love um, a bitter now. But, um, but I guess at the same time, uh, European lagers were the, a staple of my sort of late teens, early twenties drinking because they're readily available and very cheap. And um, I never had a passion for it though. I never really, I never really got into, I, I drank beer for, let's admit it, the alcohol. For, most of, for, for when I was younger, um, but for be honest, the first time I really well, like uh, discovered beer that's amazing was the first time I toured the states. Actually, really, uh, it was about a decade ago now. And um, I remember um, uh, a friend of a friend of the, uh, our band, um, a long time friend called Diana, who lives in LA. She uh, she took us out to basically some craft beer places, and it was my first ever experience tasting the American style IPA and um, also lots of American style Belgian beers. I mean, basic stuff like Blue Moon and things like that, which there was a, a whole new experience. I was like, wow, beer is actually something more than just something you get drunk from. Uh, <laughs> and um, it was from that point onwards, I started to really get much more into beer, mainly because of, I guess about 10 years ago is when the American microbrewing kind of thing was really kicking off. And, and I, yeah, I got really into it. Um, doesn't mean I know anything. I'm absolutely not nowhere near an expert, but I, enjoyed sampling and like, loads of stuff and so i guess yeah the two different periods of my life of my first beer my first beer that i ever drank and then the first time i drank beer and i was like wow this is something awesome very cool but you went on to do some really cool things with beer too uh, terrorizer asked you to i don't know i think it's a brilliant thing <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's it's very very smart uh, to to do a guide to the U.S. craft beer a few years ago. Talk to me about that, how that went down, how that was organized, and uh, the brilliant idea of getting free beer. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think that was, was it 2014 or 2015, I think it was when we were on the Sonder tour, and they were going out with the Contortionist and a few others, um, Sky Harbor era. Yeah, God, my memory's terrible, it's come back. Um, but um, yeah, so I think it was like a fourth, third or fourth tour, and so, by then, I'd been really getting into um, craft beers, especially American ones. I remember um, the first day we got there, uh, we, we played the first show, and our, our, our buyout was particularly small because there was a big package, and I guess the, the catering budget wasn't very big. And um, we ended up cutting, cutting the rider, and basically we had like no beer. And, um, and which, to be fair, if it's beer on a rider, it's usually PBR or Bud Light, so it's not mm -hmm. special. Um, but we had literally nothing, so I was like, oh shit, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is going to get really expensive really quickly if I'm drinking in bars. Or, or, uh, and, um, so I thought, well, I know. But, so let's, let's see if people bring beer in exchange for guest list, and I'll review it. And um, it was a massive success. The amount of beer that got brought down to the shows was incredible. Like, way more than we could possibly drink. <laughs> um, one thing that I also learned very much about Americans is they're all very, very proud of their local produce. That's correct. Um, and so literally you'd get like three or four people turning up with a case of beer each saying, yeah, this is the greatest beer you'll ever drink. And we're like, okay. <laughs> and um, I know, to be fair, we, we drank it, we enjoyed it, I reviewed it. And um, then that started to become a tradition. Every US tour, I've, I've, kind of, I've done a, a beer blog. I don't know if I did one on our last one, actually. In fact, I didn't. Uh, I don't know why I think I was tired. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for about three or four tours, we did it. And, um, and it was also really nice because I got to actually just, you know, it was a way to hang out with meet fans of the band and have, I guess, something in common to talk about. So I just go and hang out with people, talk about beer and drink beer. And so it was a nice sociable thing to do as well. And um, Absolutely. Yeah, tried some crazy beers. Like, and I, I do like a range of beers. I mean, you know, I love sours, I love stouts, I love IPAs. I love double IPAs. They're yeah, really delicious. And, but um, I can't really get on board with loads of the really creative ones that come out of the States, like things like this one called the breakfast beer, which had like milk and bacon and oats in it. <laughs> really? And uh, 
Ah, uh, what else? I think yeah, loads of really green tea beer. That was, I can't remember who made that, but that was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I definitely, I definitely, definitely owe you a massive props because your driver on that tour or on one of those tours was Donnie Hill. Oh, Donnie Hill, yeah. And Donnie Hill drove Cryptopsy mm. a few years ago. And he was, I had just started the podcast. And he's like, you know what you should do? You should offer guest lists in exchange for craft beer. <laughs> Tesseract did it. James did it. And you should do it too. So I started doing that. And you're 100% right. I got massive amounts of beer. <laughs> at every show and it was just insane so much fun and it is it's it's that extra little social thing when you're having a chat with someone especially sometimes you know speaking to an artist can be intimidating but if you're coming there and you're talking about beer it's something that brings us down on the same level so they they open up to us but we open up to them a little bit more too so so uh, i owe you a huge cheers and thank you for that this crisp top scene is delicious it's got hints of melon on the nose it's got like mm. that beautiful mosaic profile it's got that bohemian yeast and it mm. finishes super cereal super malty crisp delicious uh, i want to also talk about the very first time i ever saw tesseract i actually opened a gig here in Montreal when I was playing in a different band called The Catalyst for a short period of time. And you guys were playing with Devon Townsend Project. This is wow. probably one of your first tours, I think. That was the very, very first tour. That's really? 2010. Really? Yeah. Exactly. November, first, first, it was no, November 2010. Exactly. And yeah, Cafe Campus. Canada. Cafe Campus. Yeah, I remember that. Exactly. Upstairs in the, the small room. Mm. And I remember watching you guys take the stage that night and I was like, who is this fucking band? And I went home and I immediately just downloaded, you had, you had only had the EP out at the time. Yeah. Immediately hooked. I've listened to it countless times since then. So it's very, very cool to be with you. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Montreal. Subsequently, you guys have come through a bunch of times. How, what, what is your experience playing Montreal? Um, oh, it's always good. Like the crowds are always like, really crazy and enthusiastic. Um, like culturally, it's obviously very, very interesting as well because obviously it's very French, which, uh, to be honest, it's quite funny because when you tour the States and Canada together, quite often a lot of the States is very samey. Sorry, sorry, America, I don't mean to be <laughs> mean. But, but you know, like when you do, when you say travel around Europe, you know, you're in Italy one day, then you're in Spain, then you're in France, then you're in Germany, and basically different languages, different cultures, and everything. And, um, and, uh, but when you tour the States, it is, you know, everyone speaks English, everyone, I mean, obviously each state is kind of different, but it's not like different countries. Whereas when you go to Montreal, it, it's, it's almost like going to, uh, from, if you go from Toronto to Montreal, it is like you're going to a different country. Like it, everything's different, the architecture's different, the people look different, the, the vibe is different, and it's exciting. I remember every time we go there, it's really, really an exciting place. And um, I, uh, actually, my, my, my first ever real memory was um, the, the guys in Devon Townsend when we went to Montreal, uh, basically like, with this, uh, they took us for poutine. Of course they did. <laughs> <laughs> did you make but, a mistake? Did you eat it before the show? Um, I didn't, no, we went afterwards. And, um, always the right decision. A lot of musicians go in there and they hammer out a poutine before mm -hmm. their gig and then they just suffer the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's, it's a good post five beers snack exactly <laughs> <laughs> well, i remember one of the last times i was there we went to a place that did posh poutines it was like, mm -hmm. it was like gour gourmet poutine yeah <laughs> which was an interesting experience but yeah love it it's great <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> um let's dance into music a little bit let's talk about the soundtrack of your youth when you were growing up in your parents or guardians house what music was playing when you were not in control what music did your parents or guardians listen to um I think generally, generally they listen to kind of like a lot of 60s and 70s music, I guess like the Stones, the Beatles, um, and that kind of stuff. And my dad was quite a blues head, so he listened to a lot of things like B.B. King and, and uh, Chuck, well, Chuck Berry was obviously one of his favourites, and well, he still is, he's still alive, <laughs> so present tense, not past tense. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, stuff like... Like uh, yeah, George Thurgood and the Destroyers, like lots of like, very yeah, heavy guitar, well, he heavy blues music, I guess, was, was kind of one of my dad's things. Um, he was also into kind of a lot of like Cajun and sort of like just, uh, quite a diverse mix of, I guess, world folk music, um, I suppose is a way to describe it, I guess. I don't know. Um, 
yeah so that's so that's kind of my, my earliest memories of is, is that kind of music um but i think i think one thing that did strike a chord with me was kind of like the heavier guitar music was well, su surprisingly the things like <laughs> George Thorogood had like, you know, a really dirty slide guitar sound that was very, well, very heavily distorted, at least relatively back then. And um, I remember just thinking, wow, that's a wild sound. I love that. And, um, and uh, I guess indirectly that sort of thing kind of, I guess, set me on my path to discovering heavy rock music when I got older. Mm. Yeah. What would have been that first band that was your first love? It's kind of a difficult one. I mean, my first musical love was probably Michael Jackson. Don't know if you're allowed to say that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was yeah, eight years old, I remember I got the Bad album and it blew my mind. And um, uh, then when I was sort of more like uh, 10, 11, I got into The Prodigy. Yeah. And, and uh, quite a lot of and, um, things like The Orb and SL2 and like lots of like the early 90s kind of rave and electronic music I, I, I really got into that for a brief period but it was um but then i think when i was about 12 13 i heard guns and roses and then that basically got me right back into the guitar again mm -hmm. uh, and uh the use your illusion albums and then went my way back and i was like a diehard like 12 13 year old fan i loved guns and roses you know knew virtually every song inside out well, to sing, I couldn't play it back then. But <laughs> um, and then, I guess then from that, I, I guess I discovered Metallica, then basically became obsessed with them, um, bought all their records for the Black Album back. Then I remember Load came out and I was a bit broken hearted. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my band? <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, and then I guess obviously from Metallica, then that set me off on the whole metal path. So obviously you've got Megadeth, Slayer, Pantera, all the bands in that world. Then the new metal revolution kicked in. I loved that. You know, I loved Korn, Deftones. Um, then I discovered Dream Theater when I was sort of a bit older. And then that's when I got into prog. Hmm. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess it all snowballed from there, really. Funny enough, because ob an obvious band to talk about is my sugar. When I was a teenager, I was about 16, Somebody gave me the Nun EP, one of their really early EPs. And I remember listening to it and not quite getting it. And um, I remember just giving it a good go because CDs back then, you didn't have much choice. So if you had a CD, you, you may as well put the time in. It was a commitment. Exactly. And then, um, but yeah, then I kind of lost track of them. I didn't get back into them until um, Catch 33, which was mm. quite a lot later. And then, then I realized that I'd missed out on so many great albums and yeah i guess that's anyway that's that's a, that's a brief introduction to bands that i loved when i was young i love it i love it and uh i totally didn't get meshuggah either i mm. saw them open for tool here in montreal that's uh, amazing back in the day i can't remember what year it was it was probably 2000 early 2000s and i did not mm. understand them they were touring chaos fear and mm. which has subsequently become one of my favorite albums but mm. but i did not understand what the hell was going on and i just wanted to hear tool you know <laughs> mm. I just but i've grown and I, yeah how could i miss out tool as well like there's the enema album i remember getting into that and then and lateralis and they they were game changers as well like amazing bands yeah Let's talk about playing shows, something that we said we can't do right now, but <laughs> take me back to the first show that you went and witnessed, the first show that you ever saw. Um, the first show that I have in proper memory was when I was, I was probably about 12, I think. And I, I was, my dad took me to see Chuck Berry. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, a place called the, Cl the Clapham Grand, which is a s smallish venue in South London. And, um, and yeah, I absolutely loved it. Like, I mean, Chuck then, I mean, he was like in his 70s then, and like he was still ripping it, and he was still doing the duck walk and just going for it. And I remember it just blew my mind. Like, um, and that definitely was the beginning to getting hooked on live music. I think the first, the first like show I went to with friends was I saw Green Day. Really? Um, Brixton Academy in 95. No, it wasn't Green Day. I saw The Offspring. The yeah. Same year. Uh, and 95, yeah, so in fact, that year I saw The Offspring, Green Day, and Foo Fighters. Um, 
Um, and uh, oh, and I saw Metallica as well. Mm. Basically, Good ninety-five. Year. Yeah, ninety-five was the year that I started going to gigs properly and got. <laughs> and um, yeah, I went to Donington ninety-five, which was like, oh man, it was like, uh, Corrosion Conformity, Slayer, Metallica. Uh, Machine Head, Machine Head on the Burma Eyes album. Yes. Um, yeah, in fact, that's probably one of my most memorable gigs of my life. It's literally a white zombie. Um, it was, yeah, like basically low, about five or six of the bands that I loved at the time when I was 15, and I saw them all in one bill. And, and Insane. Like, Insane. How about your very first time on stage? Do you remember that? Yes, I think definitely a school concert. <laughs> Um, I can't remember which came first, but there were two in particular I remember. There was one where I played in like a funk and blues band, which was uh, kind of good fun. Um, and then there was one where me and a few mates tried to play some Metallica covers at a school concert and we sucked so, so bad. <laughs> like we were terrible. And I remember we, we, we played, we played For Whom the Bell Tolls, Enter Sandman and Nothing Else Matters. And yeah, it was terrible. And I remember we played and we sucked. And then <laughs> we were really, really upset afterwards. And yeah, we went off. I think we were about 15 at the time. And uh, yeah, we packed up our equipment and went off and drank a beer each because that's what we could handle at 15 <laughs> to drown our sorrows. And, um, and then we promised we'd practice and get better. <laughs> I don't know if that, that band didn't get any better. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Let's talk about how you've been filling the void. Uh, I'm lucky that I have the podcast, something that I can do while the whole entertainment industry crumbles and we can't tour, we can't get out there, we can't get that feeling, that amazing hair on the arm, raising experience of performing and connecting with an audience. I know that you're very, very busy with your being a publicist. You have your whole tight PR company. Um, is that how you've been filling the void? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's been ticking along as it would do normally. I mean, I guess when all this kicked off, one worry was that the work would dry up there. But in fact, it's been kind of the opposite because bands have got nothing else to do other than release music now. So um, there's been, in fact, for the, the second half of 2020, I think it was probably one of the biggest years or biggest periods for releases ever. Mm -hmm. like not, not just for us, but for across the board. So many releases came out. And um so yeah, I've been keeping busy with that. Um, but also Tesseract's been kind of busy behind the scenes. We've uh, just uh, recorded a live stream, which was, we're going to put out next Saturday, which when this goes out, will have gone out. So <laughs> Exactly, yes. We're talking about this in the past tense. But <laughs> past tense, yeah. So Portals. we did a live stream. <laughs> Portals, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, um, yeah, I don't know how honest some bands are with this stuff, but we've been straight up and said we've recorded it and we're going to put it out. <laughs> Good for you guys. No, 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 yeah, because I, I would just freak out with the, the, the technical issues. If there anything goes wrong, I would, I would feel horrible. People having paid, and it would mm. just drive me crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. There's the basic technical issues of making sure the stream actually functions properly, but then there's also, um, uh, well, we've gone, we've basically gone for a pretty elaborate light show. We've got like a laser show. Very there's cool. a screen at the back and there's they're like cinematic elements brought in as well like there's some actors and doing, like it's basically almost like a, a gig movie kind of thing um so so yeah there'd been no way we could have pulled it off actually live but we did perform live although i say we perform live we performed live three times so i'm sure i probably shouldn't say this but <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure we took the best takes <laughs> How was it? Was it nice to be back uh, in the same room, at least with the boys and, and playing together again? Yeah, it was super nice. It was really nice. Um, sadly, our drummer couldn't make it because our drummer mm. lives, in Aust he lives in Austin, Texas. So, um, That's true. Um, the drummer of Monuments. Yeah, so the drummer of Monuments filled in and Mike. And he absolutely nailed it. Like, I'm amazed he learned nearly two hours of music in a month. Like, he's crazy, crazy kid. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so... That, that's taken up some of our time. We've also been slowly uh, chipping away at a new record as well. Awesome. Awesome, yes. awesome. So yeah, uh, keeping busy. Awesome, yes. I, I definitely wanted to talk about the live stream and Portals, uh, yeah. Name Portal, Name Portals, and um, doing something different, like with the, the, the cinema, cinem, cinematic aspects you guys have added to it. 
uh, it has to be something special if you're going to do something like this now. You can't just play in a room anymore. Um, Behemoth nailed it. They did such mm. a sick, sick, sick live stream. Yeah. Um, I'm sure your guys is going to be great as well. Was great. This is complicated <laughs> <laughs> to talk about. I knew it was going to be like this. But um, yeah, to take take me to the whole creation of this, what you guys put into it, what what uh, your mindset was when creating a live stream, and why you waited until now to do it. Um, well, I guess I'll answer the last one first. Um, I guess we waited this long because we, uh, well, I guess we we never really intended to do it. I suppose it's, it was. Um, you know, when the pandemic kicked off and everyone was putting out live streams, so we're like, oh yeah, we're still gonna have a quiet year this year, Let's see what happens. And then as this has just gone on and on and on, and loads of bands have done it, um, um, we've, we, we've thought, well, actually maybe this is something we should do, um, not only as a potential you know, slight revenue stream, but also just to do something cool. Why don't we try and do something really you know, wacky and crazy and um, that's not just you know, trying to recreate a, a gig in someone's living room. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Amos, the, uh, the bassist, has been the real driver on this. He uh, he was kind of the producer for the project and like co-director, um, and so he can, he basically pulled the whole thing together. Um, but basically, what it is, it's it's a concert that's broken up into five kind of acts. So various uh, songs are grouped together um, to basically tell a story, and the story basically goes through lots of the. Um, it kind of hints at lots of the concepts from the record um, and it basically draws from those and um, but it's also quite abstract as well it's not like an obvious narrative mm -hmm. um, but um, if anyone's geeky enough to have you know, looked into what the album concepts are all about they, they should click with them and they'll get it and if not then people might just enjoy this kind of surreal journey uh, that this particular character, character takes through it and, um, and how that ties into the the album and um, and uh yeah, it's come out. It's come out pretty, pretty, pretty well. I think. I hope so. I hope people like it. Maybe they did like it. We don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're gonna love it. I'm sure they're gonna love it. I wanted to talk a little bit about gent, mm. the the genre. You guys being packaged into that. I'm not necessarily on board with that. I think you guys are more than just a gent band. What what is your opinion on this the gent style and the multitude of bands that have you know basically stemmed from their love of Meshuggah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's quite funny you mention this, actually, because um, obviously this is an ongoing conversation that we end up having. And um, I dipped into a, a Gent 2020 playlist the other day, just because um, at work somebody was talking about it. And I, like, I only knew like two of the bands. There are like hundreds mm. of bands in there that I didn't even know about. And considering I work in the industry, I was kind of... I was kind of disappointed in myself. I was like, wow, <laughs> who the hell are all these men? But, um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's like, I guess we were a band before that word was popularized. And um, I remember, I mean, basically, periphery, it's pr very clever marketing from Periphery. They kind of really popularized it and got everyone talking about it. And hats off to them. They've been really smart and, and they've done it in a really fun way as well. Like they're a very fun band, very fun characters. And they basically kind of, created this, I say genre, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of, I suppose it kind of is, a, lots of bands do sound quite similar, but it's, uh, the thing what they have created is a kind of a community of like loads of bands, at least from like the first wave that we were a part of, there's you know, Us, Monuments, Periphery, and Chin Spanner, and then you know, uh, Sky Harbor and all these bands. Like, uh, we've kind of all been sort of lumped together, but I guess we also kind of knew each other from chatting online anyway, and it's just kind of a nice umbrella term for like that early community. Um, mm. but, now, but now, obviously, as I've discovered, well, I mean, I was aware that there are more bands and there are more <laughs> bands, but there are a silly amount now. It's something that's spawned into something much, much bigger. And I guess that's kind of cool. It's kind of, it's really nice to have been a part of that. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think, well, obviously, Meshuggah are completely to blame for all of this. But <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Is there moments where you go and you listen to these tracks and you're like, damn it, they stole that idea. I could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> there goes that next song. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, let's talk about a Tesseract craft beer. Have you guys made one? I, I stumbled across one from Grimm called yes. Tesseract. Is that actually your collab or is it just a brew called Tesseract? No, it's just a brew called Tesseract. Although I think it's maybe Polaris Hops, actually, which I think is a weird 
very, nice very. <laughs> Have you ever thought of doing a, a collab brew for Test Rack? Funny enough, well, yeah, we've talked about it. The biggest problem is nobody in the band can decide what, because um, I'm kind of I'm kind of like a beer slut. I drink it all. I'm, I'm a fan <laughs> of every kind of beer, apart from yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of yeah, brick, you know, beer with bacon in it and things like that. But, weird, weird <laughs> adjuncts, yeah. Yeah. but um so i'll go along with everything but like um i know like uh like moss is very into kind of uh sort of a belgian style beers like tri triples and quads and kind of those heavy uh bears uh, Ackle really loves kind of red ales and so um, and, and, thing, and dan is a big fan of basically traditional british ales like the traditional ipa and and bitters and that kind of thing and jay i think because he's in the states has become very accustomed to lots of ipa <laughs> And basically, none of it, we can't between us really decide what kind of beer we would, ha we would have. But I guess we're going to have to because we're actually talking to, um, well, funny enough, Northern Monk. That's really, very cool. Us, um, to, about doing a beer. So hopefully, hopefully we'll have a beer at some point, maybe next year. But I can't tell you what it is because we can't decide between us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good problem to have. Uh, you could you could do a whole uh, mix case. Mm the tesseract the tesseract pack i love it i i i, yeah. I think it's a good idea <laughs> i think what would be quite nice is i don't know nobody's really done like a belgian sour like a goose kind of beer i think that'd be quite good but i don't know how easy that is to do because other than like the traditional belgian ones i've never really been that impressed by more modern breweries attempts at them but then i'm not an expert i'm, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> you're just you, yeah. you, you enjoy it you enjoy them I do. Uh, and let's wrap this up with one last question. It probably never happens to you, even though you do enjoy brews, you seem to be very put together and you know your limits, but every once in a while it happens to everyone. What is your hangover cure? Oh, oh dear. Uh, to be fair, I guess I don't really have a hangover cure, but I have like a hangover, pre-hangover management. So if I'm drinking a lot, I try to maintain uh, matching it with water. I don't mm -hmm. always do this. Um, <laughs> We always seem to have good intentions to do that. Mm, but um, actually, one of the most effective thing is that there's a. Oh, in fact, I learned this off somebody on the road in the states. Um, may have even been Donny Hill actually. Um, <laughs> but there's this stuff called Pedialyte mm -hmm. um, that you get over the counter in the states. It's like an electrolyte booster thing. Mm -hmm. I have a good chug of that before you go to bed. Then in the morning, have some of that, and then make sure you eat some breakfast that soaks, soaks it up. That kind of works. But yeah, I don't know. Generally, I don't think there is any real here, here for a hangover. I think when you're hungover, it's your punishment. Deal with it. <laughs> Get on with the day. <laughs> Suck it up. I love it. James, <laughs> thank you so, so much for taking the time talking to me about your life, music, and craft beer. I've had no a blast. Worries. And uh, I'm a huge fan, and I'm going to be a fan for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate hanging out with you for a moment. Cheers. Yeah, likewise. Cheers. And um, yeah, it's quite a compliment coming from you. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. What an epic chat with James. Just awesome to hook up with people that uh, I'm a huge fan of, actually. I've been following the band for quite some time, as I mentioned during the interview. It's always very, very cool to just make an instant connection with someone. I say this a lot, but it's absolutely true. There's something special to look up to someone, to listen to their music, and then when you finally sit down and have a chat with them, share a brew, you can see yourself becoming friends. And uh, that was absolutely the case with James. Super stoked to see you in the future and to share a brew in real life right after this apocalypse. If you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should absolutely subscribe to it on the podcast platform of your choice. But not only that, you should take the time to rate it and write a review, because if you do that, more people just like yourself will be able to discuss Discover the Vox and Hops podcast. Vox and Hops is brought to you by Sound Talent Media. I have one more episode coming at you this Friday, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops hits. Oh,